Oh, Abby, can you hear me? I think I'm unmuted. Yes, yep, you're good to go. Oh, okay, great, great, excellent. And can you see my slides as a, as a slideshow? Excellent. Yes, we can. Well, listen, um, thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be with you guys tonight. And, um, you know, Abby asked me if I could speak about the Ross procedure, which, as some of you know, is a, is a topic that has been very uh, close to my, you know, interests for the last 10 to 15 years now. And what I'll try to present to you over the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes is the why and the how of the ROS procedure. So we'll look into the rationale initially, and then, and then I'll show you some uh, uh, videos about, you know, the surgical technique itself, because I know that this is mostly a surgical um, um, a list of participants. And I'm really uh, happy to see some names on the list, uh, a, a lot of whom I miss because of COVID, but hopefully we'll all be together soon in the next and, and then upcoming uh, CCC meeting, I hope. In any case, so um, my talk today will be the Ross, and this is um, the scenario that we'll be discussing. This is a 50-year-old patient who has a uh, previous history of smoking, who presents with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and normal ejection fraction. And the question is, what do you do with this patient? You have essentially three main options. Either you put a mechanical valve you know, for durability or you put a tissue valve. Um, but there's also an alternative, and that is the ROS procedure. And the question is, does it apply? Why would it apply? And what's the difference between this and the other options? And again, let's, let's remember that the focus of this presentation is non-elderly adults, which are not only patients in their 20s and 30s, but patients up to the age of 60 or 65. And the difference between these patients and the elderly patients is that they're physically more active and therefore the demand from a functional and from a myocardial performance standpoint is obviously higher than patients in their 70s and 80s. Quality of life is important to all patients but it's particularly important for someone who is still very active physically and professionally and they have young families and they have to travel and you know it's it, a lot of these things come into mind and it, it may be difficult to quantify but I'm sure that all of you if you had to undergo surgery tomorrow morning the first thing you think about is how will this impact my quality of life. And the, the most striking feature between a non-elderly and, and an older patient is the prolonged anticipated life expectancy of a younger patient, which exposes them to you know, um, the risk of valve-related complications in the long term, whether that be degeneration and reoperation with tissue valves or bleeding and thromboembolism with mechanical valves. So the first point that we have to discuss when it comes to rationale of why to do a ROS is really what about conventional aortic valve replacement in these non-elderly adults? And the first point I wanna to bring to your attention is that conventional aortic valve replacement in non-elderly adults is associated with excess long-term mortality, not short-term, long-term mortality. And remember, all, everything we'll be focused on today is really on the long game. It's not, again, it's not exactly the same calculation that you make with the majority of patients that you see with aortic valve disease where you want to relieve symptoms and get them you know, across the next 10 to 15 years. In these patients, you really want to get them to blow their 85th birthday candles, which means you know, looking at the next 20 to 30 years, if not more. Um, and this is a study that comes from Sweden. Why is Sweden interesting? Because they have a national registry for all patients undergoing cardiac surgery. And because Sweden is a small enough and, and, and they have a, 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 a national health service, well, it is possible to track these patients very effectively over time. And this study, which dates back now to 2000, examined observed versus expected survival after aortic valve replacement using a tissue or a mechanical valve. And what you see in the white dots is the mortality of the age and sex match general population and the black dots is the mortality after surgery, after AVR um, in these in, in age and sex match patients. And you see that the mortality is significantly higher after about seven or eight years from the time of surgery. Now, if I show you this graph and I ask you, why do you think that is? I'm sure that intuitively, a lot of you will say, well, it's probably the older patients are probably a bit sicker and that's what drives this difference in expected versus observed mortality in the long term. Well, the authors actually stratified the patients according to their age at the time of surgery. And surprisingly, the younger patients, those under the age of 50 at the time of surgery, had the highest OE ratio at 4.5, observed to expected uh, uh, ratio of death. And the older the patients were, 
the less of a difference there was in terms of observed and expected survival. So in other words, the younger the patient is at the time of surgery, the higher that excess mortality is in the long term. It may sound very counterintuitive, and you may think this is just about one study, but I'll show you some more studies that support that notion. When I started my practice in Montreal in 2010, the first question we asked was, what about our patients in our hospitals, in our Canadian system, undergoing isolated elective mechanical aortic valve replacement? Ismail Bahut, who was a, a medical student at the time, who's currently a congenital fellow in, at Columbia here in, in uh, New York City, undertook this study as, a, as part of his master's degree, where he, we tracked 470 consecutive isolated mechanical AVRs in patients under the age of 65, and we excluded anything that we thought may impact long-term outcomes, so concomitant procedures, coronary disease, reoperations, dissections, endocarditis, and so on. The mean age of the patients was 53 years of age, and the mean follow-up was nine years, so pretty substantial duration of follow-up. And looking at their survival versus the Quebec sex and age, uh, age and sex match general population in green, you can see that survival of these patients in blue was significantly lower at 10 years, and that gap continued to increase you know, as the years went forward. And in fact, when we combine reoperation, which is a rare event after a mechanical AVR, but not zero, with mortality, survival free from reoperation was a mere 82% at 10 years. In other words, at 10 years, one in five patients was either dead or reoperated 10 years after surgery for isolated elective mechanical AVR. These were patients in their early 50s with normal ejection fractions and just uh, essentially isolated aortic stenosis, just like the case I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Well, what about tissue aortic valve replacement? I'm sure some of you may think, well, maybe this is related to anticoagulation. Maybe they're bleeding. And indeed, some of them do bleed. But tissue AVR doesn't really relieve or absence of anticoagulation doesn't fix the problem. This is a study from the Cleveland Clinic looking at over 3,000 patients undergoing tissue AVR, and their conclusions were very similar. Younger patients had worse than expected survival that was further diminished with insertion of a small prosthesis. So introducing the notion of patient prosthesis mismatch, but importantly, the notion that younger patients perhaps have less good survival than that, than the expected in the general population. This is another study that is often cited in liter literature by one of our former fellows in Montreal, Thierry Bourguignon, we looked at over 2,500 patients undergoing tissue AVR in France. And what he did is he stratified the patients according to their age, as you can see here in the X axis. He, in black is the observed survival of these patients after tissue AVR. And in gray is the expected survival in the age and sex match French population. And very similar to that Swedish study I showed you, older patients had an OE ratio of close to one. And the younger the patients were, the higher that OE ratio of for mortality was. And you can see that a patient in their 40s had almost 20 years of amputated life expectancy uh, after surgery. In fact, he published another studies where they focused on patients aged 50 to 65. And that study is pretty interesting because you'll see it often cited by industry to show you that mean dura median durability of a tissue valve is now excellent. It's around 19 years uh, in these patients who aged 50 to 65 who undergo a tissue AVR. If you ask me at age 55, if I get a tissue AVR and it will last until I'm about 74 and then I get my valve valve, that sounds like a very reasonable proposition, except you really can't dissociate structural valve degeneration from survival. If the patients are not alive, they will never have structural valve degeneration. They are competing risks. And so before you ever look at this curve, always ask the question of how many patients are still alive that are still at risk of having structural valve degeneration. And in this study at 15 years, almost half the patients were already dead. If you're dead, you'll never have structural valve degeneration. And I guarantee you, you'll never have a reoperation. Well, this is another study again from Sweden, more recently published of over 3000 patients under the age of 60. And again, they stratified the patients according to their age. And again, you see the same message. Older patients have a one-to-one -one ratio of survival. And the younger the patients are, the more of a gap there is between observed and expected survival. And the last study I'll show you is this one in the New England Journal of Medicine published by 
Andrew Goldstone, who's now a, a fellow at, at CHOP, of almost 10,000 isolated AVRs under the age of 65. And again, at, if, when they stratified the patients between the age of 45 to 54, 15 year mortality was 26 to 30%. And patients 55 to 64, it was 32 to 36%. Forget differences between tissue and mechanical AVR. The main point is that one in four to one in three patients were dead 15 years only after their AVR, their isolated AVR. If that is not sobering data, then you know I, I don't think that we're really doing what we think we're doing by replacing aortic valves with uh, prosthetic material. Except we need to follow the patients in the long term to actually get to these results. So if you only look at the short game, our short game is excellent. Mortality is very, very good with, the, in the, with these operations, but the long game is perhaps not as good. And so I'd submit to you that conventional AVR in these patients is far from being a curative approach it is at best a palliative approach. And I took this slide from Amin Mazin, who you all know in Toronto, who presents the differences between mechanical and biological AVR, but essentially saying that prosthetic AVR in young patients is palliative. And instead of looking at the differences and the pros and cons of mechanical versus uh, biological, one should rather look at the similarities between the two. And the common point between the two is that they're both acellular non-living substitutes with no potential for growth, repair, or adaptation. And why is that important? Because the two reasons why I think we are seeing this gap in survival versus the general population after conventional AVR is one, hemodynamics, and two, biology. And in terms of hemodynamics, I think you, all of us should really think patient prosthesis mismatch anytime we're doing any aortic valve surgery because an AVR is not an AVR is not an AVR. And a lot of patients actually leave the hospital with some degree of PPM. This is a recent review by Catherine Otto showing that nearly 40 to 45% of patients leave the hospital after an AVR with some degree of patient prosthesis mismatch. Mismatch is perhaps not that important in older patients, but in younger patients, it has a direct impact on overall survival. And it also has a direct impact on durability of the tissue valve and it even has a direct impact on the one-year survival for valve in valve after a degenerated uh, tissue valve uh, uh, in that position. So it really is something that we need to pay more careful attention to. And for those of you who are hearing a lot of you know, notions that, that um, transcatheter valves have perfect hemodynamics and for small annuli or they perform better than tissue valves, the reality is perhaps not as as clear as that. This, these are results from the PARTNER-3 trial where they looked at moderate and severe mismatch in both groups. And the incidence was exactly similar, if not higher in the TAVAR group than in the surgical group. In fact, when they looked at the two-year outcomes from the PARTNER-3 trial, I only want you to focus on that one line, the incidence of mean gradient over 20 in both groups. And it was already at 10% two years only after the TAVAR in patients age 74 versus 5% in the surgical group. So again, you know, a big word of caution about the hemodynamic performance of transcatheter valves, at least the balloon infl inflatable ones um, um, from a hemodynamic standpoint. Secondly, the aortic root is a living structure and that goes back to the biology point. I spent four years during my fellowship in the lab really studying aortic valves and aortic valve components and what I can tell you is that aortic valve cusps are very similar to blood vessels. They are very complex. They have a single layer of endothelial cells on both sides. They have a population of cells within the body of the leaflets called interstitial cells, which are a mixed population of cells with smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, myofibroblasts. These cells can contract, they can repair, they can adapt, they can repair. They can do all these different things during the cardiac cycle. And they, remember an aortic valve is only about a third of a millimeter in thickness. It opens and shuts over a hundred thousand times every single day. It has to adapt to changing hemodynamic conditions and it performs normally for a, 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 a lifetime in a normal tricuspid aortic valve. So certainly no level of prosthetic anything can really reproduce this biology. And that is why when you look at and the aortic valve and the aortic root complex, 
you have perfect laminar flow through a, a normal aortic root a normal coronary flow reserve and very little ventricular workload. Um, uh, and that is really what allows patients to have, or rather normal uh, 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 individual or healthy individuals with normal aortic valves to have, you know, plentiful uh, lifelong aortic valve and, and cardiac function. Um, and that is perhaps why when you put a prosthetic valve, you may not have quite the same result. But the bottom line behind the biology for us clinicians is that that living structure, which performs very many complex functions, which we won't go into uh, the heavy detail, translates into excellent durability, into excellent hemodynamics with you know, very little gradient both at rest and with exercise, low thrombogenicity because these endothelial cells can produce nitric oxide, which prevents platelet aggregation, and good resistance to infections because they can mount an inflammatory reaction anytime there's bacteria in the blood. And all of these little things, the durability, the hemodynamics, the thrombogenicity, the likelihood of endocarditis, all of this is what determines what we call clinically relevant endpoints, survival, valve-related complications, and even quality of life after aortic valve replacement. So the question is, what is the role of the ROS procedure? And what is the rationale? Well, the rationale is that perhaps if you have a living aortic valve substitute that can perform that can have both biologic and hemodynamic features that are better than a prosthetic valve that may translate into improvements in these clinically relevant outcomes. And the ROS procedure, which consists of taking the pulmonary valve and root and implanting it on the left side, is the only operation, replacement operation, that guarantees long-term viability of the aortic valve and root. We have explants now 30 and up to even 40 years after the ROS and when we look under the microscope, we can still see that trilaminar structure with endothelial and interstitial cells in the body of the leaflet. So the ROS is an old operation. Um, it, is, it was described initially in, in 1962, and the first results were published in 67 by Donald Ross himself, who was a South African surgeon practicing in London. And you have to take yourself back to a time where there were no tissue valves, and there were only very clunky mechanical valves and only aortic homographs. And the majority of these patients were young patients with rheumatic disease. So it was both a challenging patient population when using homographs and also a very challenging patient population when uh, faced with all the thromboembolic and bleeding events. And so he came up with this idea that perhaps taking a mirror image of a normal aortic valve, i.e. the pulmonary valve, putting it in the aortic position, which is the most important position in the heart, and then replacing the pulmonary with a pulmonary homograph, so a cadaveric one, in a position where the stresses and the pressures are lower may actually translate into better outcomes because this is now a living autologous valve on the left side. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard some of these comments that either I don't believe in the ROS procedure, that all these patients come back for reoperation. Oh, I sent a patient for ROS and he ended up in ECMO or why don't we simply put a large tissue valve and then do a valve in valve procedure? And I'll show you why some of these um, arguments are perhaps a little too simplistic and we need to be a little bit more um, evidence-based when, when talking about um, these things. This is a really a, a true state of the art review on the ROS procedure, which was authored by Amin um, a couple of years ago, which still remains very relevant and you can see that the list of co-authors is very um, illustrious with Bob Bono, um, uh, Professor Yacoub, Dr. David. I mean, this is a really, I encourage all of you who are interested in this topic to read this because there's no amount of, of information that I will be able to give over 30 minutes that, that um, nearly um, mirrors what, what Amin put into this uh, review. But what I will do in my next 10 minutes and then I'll show you the video is focus on one element and that is survival in terms of long-term outcomes. And the reason is that survival is really a binary outcome. You're either alive or you're dead. Uh, if I look at NYHA or six minute walk tests or all these things are a bit subjective and you can play with them, but survival you really can't argue with, with it. And I'll show you some of the data. This is a, I had the opportunity when doing my fellowship to examine this data. Um, Professor Yacoub had undertaken this prospective randomized trial, one of the few in our open valvular surgery uh, literature uh, 
where they compared the ROS procedure to aortic homocrafts, which in the 90s were still very popular for young patients because of their hemodynamic uh, benefit, and looked at the long-term outcomes. The patients were age 39 at the time of surgery, and they were really all comer patients, unlike what you see in many of the randomized trials where the exclusion criteria are very tight. In this case, 8% of the patients were operated on for active endocarditis, and almost half the patients were redo operations, with the most common previous operation being a homograft root replacement. So by no means were these patients destined to very good long-term outcomes. And yet when we looked at their survival up to 12 years, you can see that the ROS group versus the general population had identical survival, whereas the patients that had a homograft root replacement had slightly lower um, survival at 12 years. Um, this is another study from uh, Dr. David in Toronto, his series of 200 patients. The mean age is 34, the mean follow-up is 10 years, and you can see that survival is exactly identical to the Ontario age and gender match population in 15 years. In fact, when they updated the data to 20 years, again, survival on the left-hand side is exactly identical to the general population. And importantly, looking at survival free from reoperation on the right-hand side, you can see that it's mostly driven by reoperation versus death, as opposed to what I showed you earlier, where the survival free from reop was mostly driven by death rather than reoperation. And I'm sure if you ask any patient, they'd rather be um, alive and reoperated than dead and never have a reoperation. Although most patients are still alive and free from any reoperation in this um, series. Well, you may say, Dr. Yakub, Dr. David, these are really phenomenal and masterful surgeons. What about the rest of us? This was just published last week in Jack from the German Ross Registry, a combination of 10 sites, almost 2,500 patients, the average age was 44 and the mean follow-up was 11 years. Forget that last line, this was actually from a, uh, there are more patients um, over 10 years of follow-up. And their survival was again identical to that of the German age and sex match general population with very good durability data. This is freedom or cumulative incidence of autograft intervention was around 0.7% patient year. And on the right side, about 0.6% patient year. And this dates back to 1988. So a combined 1.2 to 1.3% uh, per year uh, reoperation range in, uh, in patients in their early 40s at the time of surgery, which is pretty remarkable considering that their survival was identical to the general population. This is another study from the UK using national registry data where they performed a propensity matched analysis with mechanical and tissue AVR and again, survival of free from reop is better in ROS patients, followed by mechanical, followed by tissue ABR. This is another comparative study from Australia, and I'm showing you these studies to show you that they really come from different geographies. It's not one country or continent. Um, and they performed the propensity matched analysis, and at 20 years, there's a 10% survival difference between a ROS and a mechanical ABR. In fact, if you look at a means uh, review, these are many more studies all of which have a pretty long mean duration of follow-up and all of which show a 15 and 20 year survival um, that is exactly identical to the general population. So it's a very consistent um, signal of restored survival in the long term. And that is why I think that the ROS is really the only replacement operation that to this day has been shown to restore long-term survival after the operation. Well, then you may ask, what is the Achilles heel of the ROS operation? I think it's twofold. One is surgical risk and complexity. And secondly, it's possibly durability of the operation. And I just want to show you this, um, this, this data here. This is my um, uh, volumes of reconstructive aortic surgery. And the reason I show it to all the residents is for a single reason. I started my practice at the Montreal Heart in 2010. And you can see that by no means were we an established aortic center with expertise in the Ross procedure and and large volumes of aortic valve repair or valve sparing surgeries, but rather we had a committed group of surgeons, cardiologists, imaging, anesthesia, and ICU who were all committed to establishing a dedicated aortic program. And you can see that the volumes increased over the years. And our ROS program includes now, or at least my um, experience, over 500 patients. The average age is 48. And somewhat all comers, 15% are reduced and 6% had active endocarditis. The operative mortality is very comparable to that of regular AVR at 
And again, that includes my learning curve as a surgeon and my learning curve as an aortic surgeon and particularly as a Ross surgeon. So I think these operations can be done safely if you are committed to understanding the principles of aortic root surgery. And there certainly is a learning curve. You see the two yellow dots are, are both mortalities in our series. In fact, they both occurred in our first 100 patients together with most of the morbidities associated with the operation. But in the last 400 plus patients, you can see that it's become uh, even more safe uh, as we've uh, uh, gained experience with it. Survival our, of our patients so far is similar to the general population. But interestingly, look at hemodynamics. The mean indexed effective orifice area discharge is 1.5 square centimeter per square meter. The mean gradient is five millimeters of mercury and the prevalence of moderate or severe mismatch is 0%. There's not a single prosthetic AVR that can match these uh, data. And the, importantly, the gradients, unlike what you see with tissue AVR, do not increase over time. They remain in the single digits. And what about reoperation? Well, reoperation is, is obviously an important element, but reoperation is tightly linked to surgical technique. And again, I keep repeating Amin's name. He's really contributed a ton to um, uh, the Ross procedure. This is a paper he wrote with Ali Ghanem, another uh, 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 resident who was at McGill University and uh, who both wrote this uh, uh, technique paper on the Ross procedure. And I won't belabor the point because I'll show you a video, but the main point that I wanna to bring to your attention is the difference between an aortic root and a pulmonary root. You see an aortic root really has a fibrous annulus, as you can see there on the left-hand side, at least along a part of the uh, aortic annulus, whereas the pulmonary valve really does not have anything such as an annulus. It is pushed upward by the infundibular muscle. And when you harvest that pulmonary root, that muscle here becomes devascularized, it becomes necrotic, and therefore it provides no structural support to that pulmonary root. And I think one of the early mistakes was to leave a long sleeve of muscle there and just to run a suture line along the aortic annulus, which then meant that the pulmonary autograft was sitting in a supraannular position under systemic pressures, and that would obviously expose it to potential early and late dilatation. So one of the key principles is to try to implant the pulmonary autograft within the aortic annulus, almost in an infraannular position so that the native aortic annulus can then serve as um, support for that pulmonary autograft. And this is just one of many uh, technical details which you'll find in that, in that Amin and Ali paper. But importantly, if you follow all of these techniques, as shown by some of the pioneers in that field, this is Dr. David's series where he compared um, Ross versus mechanical AVR in this propensity matched uh, analysis study. And again, Amin was the first author of the circulation paper. And up to 20 years, there were no difference in uh, the rate of reintervention between Ross and mechanical AVR. In fact, if you look at many more studies, again, with long-term follow-up data, the cumulative incidence of reoperation was around 1% per patient year range, which in young adults with normal survival up to 20 years is actually pretty remarkable. Uh, and compares very favorably, even with mechanical AVR, even with the mortality that we observe with mechanical AVR. So I think that, you know, the, 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 just talking about sentiment or belief or having a belief system is not enough anymore. What we are, what we have seen in the last decade is an accumulation of evidence. I showed you just very little of it here, just to give you a taste. But I think that there's a real, there's real momentum and a real renaissance, or at least a Ross 2.0 version uh, that we're seeing in recent years. And you can see them in some of these editorials. This is Dr. David suggesting that the Ross procedure is the best operation to treat aortic stenosis in young and middle-aged adults. I don't think you can be any more clear about uh, making a statement. This is from the Cleveland Clinic. Is it time to reconsider use of the Ross in adults? This is from Mike Borger in Leipzig, time to reevaluate the guidelines. And this is our most recent editorial in Jack. Uh, is it the ideal aortic valve substitute, which I had the opportunity to co-write with Rick Nishimura, um, who's one of the um, uh, co-chairs of the um, ACCHA valve guidelines. Um, so I think the paradigm is really, has really evolved from the simple question of when you see a 40 or 50 year old, 
do you want anticoagulation or do you want a reoperation? And that may be a valve and valve procedure to the question of what is the survival and what is the quality of life that we can anticipate with the choice of prosthesis that we give you? And I think that different choices have a direct impact on survival and quality of life. And we have enough evidence today to be able to support and inform patients in a very uh, clear way as to what the impact of these choices have uh, on their uh, long-term survival. I'll skip this, because, but just this is our algorithm as to how we approach young patients with um, aortic valve disease who require surgery. But suffice it to say, to summarize, that in non-elderly adults, I think the type of surgery has a direct impact on long-term prognosis. Prosthetic AVR in these patients is associated with excess long-term mortality versus the general population. A living aortic valve substitute, and that applies to aortic valve repair, but in this, in our particular case, to aortic valve replacement with a pulmonary autograft that has provides unique biologic and hemodynamic features, which we cannot re replicate with prosthetic valves, which translate into similar operative risk in dedicated high volume centers, excellent quality of life, better freedom from valve related complications. And I didn't go into any of the endocarditis. Uh, thromboembolism, bleeding, and so on, but, but there's plenty of data out there. Certainly better hemodynamics with no mismatch, both at rest and with exercise, and most importantly, restored long-term survival. And so if we go back to the case scenario that I presented earlier in the presentation, what would you uh, propose to that 50-year-old patient? I'll show you the video of that very patient. Uh, let me just stop the this here and slide the video over because it's a very large file um, and let me know if you see, if you don't see it i'll play it here so this is that same 54 year old patient with a severe symptomatic aortic stenosis i don't know what that red line is but um, anyhow this as you can see the valve is very calcified i'll just walk you through the steps of a ROS procedure i hope we're still okay with time abby please interrupt me if we're not no, you're great. Uh, okay, so I like to transect the aorta. And the first thing you do when you do any root surgery is expose yourself. I use five sutures here, five pop-up sutures, three above the commissures and one above each of the coronary ostia. And that really exposes the, the aortic root very, very nicely. You see, this is a very heavily calcified type zero bicuspid aortic valve. Both commissures are almost at 180 degrees. So definitely non-repairable aortic valve. The repair would always be plan A in any patient. So it's important to get all these the leaflets out and to uh, thoroughly decalcify. The next step is mobilizing the coronary ostia. And what I like to do and, and teach the residents is to go down and it is to cut it in a rectangular fashion so that there's really no chance of causing any torsion when you re-implant the coronary. If you cut it in a circle shape, it's very easy to have a 90 degree torsion when you re-implant. So a rectangle and that suture at 12 o'clock will ensure that orientation is always perfect. And then secondly, in terms, of, in terms of mobilizing, you can see the cautery here is mobilizing the aorta away from the coronary rather than the other way around, which is also important. Because we're doing a ROS, I'm mobilizing behind the left main just to mobilize the back of the PA as well. And then we mobilize the right. You see two straight lines on either side, leaving about two millimeters of um, aortic wall on either side and then connecting both of these at the bottom and then with low grade cautery burning the aorta away from the coronary and not over mobilizing that coronary otherwise that's how you can get some kinks when you re-implant just burn that little fat dissociate the coronary from the aorta and that's all you need to do and then be again because we're doing a ROS here then you separate this is the left right commissure aortic tissue and you separate the aorta from the PA there's always a ligament there called the ligament of the infundibulum, which you have to cross into that fatty plane there um, and keep working your way down there. This is the same dissection you would do for a valve sparing root surgery. Keep working your way. There's nothing to injure around there. And that really mobilizes the pulmonary root uh, uh, sideways. Before we shift our attention to the right side, we examine the aortic roots. It's important to make sure that we have symmetry of the commissures. In this case, it's a type um, zero bicuspid. So the commissures are 180 degrees apart. So we have to completely ignore those. I use this little 
a tool here that has lines at 120 degrees. And you can see that with the marker, I'm repositioning three neo commissures, and that's what we'll use to implant the autograft because the commissures on the pulmonary valve are usually at 120 degrees from each other. So you see these lines are now at 120 degrees of each other. And also, because we only have two very high commissures, we'll implant the autograft in a planar fashion so that there's also symmetry in the height of the commissures. So the next step is then harvesting the autograft. You see the assistant is pulling on the, P, on the heart down and that linearizes the PA. And we just cut proximal to the right PA and transect the pulmonary artery uh, at once. There's nothing to injure behind the PA there. It's all soft connective tissue, which as you'll see will burn with, again, low grade cautery and that will lift the PA up from the plane of the heart. The only thing to keep in mind is that the left main cross is behind the PA. So that, that cautery here has to be done be close to the PA tissue itself. And the forceps, which I'm holding in my left hand, has to always protect the left main and the LED in the back, which you see here on this video. Once we lifted the PA off the plane of the heart, we then examine the leaflets, making sure that we have a tri valve. There are no major fenestrations. You can see the valve here, it looks very nice. And then we go just below the nadir of the anterior facing leaflet or cusp. And we just transect the RV right there. I'm just drawing with a pen here to show you where the uh, base of the cusps is. With the cautery, you just burn that fat on the outside, which usually has a lot of little vessels. And then with a uh, 15 blade, you just work your way inside the um, RV muscle. And then under direct vision with scissors, you simply follow the plane of implantation of the cusps, uh, leaving about two to three millimeters of muscle below that implantation line. So this is all under direct vision um, and all that yellow stuff, you just burn it with the cautery. Again, where there's really very little to injure when you work in your way behind here. This is all RV or infundibular free wall. And then you hit right there the septum. This is where the septal perforated usually comes up the first septal artery. So you just take partial thickness bites through that muscle right there. You stay close to the um, to the uh, hinge point of the leaflets. And then with low grade cautery, you just lift the entire thing off the base of the heart. Um, this video is running at one point something speed. So this is not as fa how fast we, <laughs> we usually use the cautery. You have to just take your time to do this operation. Um, this is the area where the first septal may cross. You have to stay superficial, take your time, keep flipping the PA back and forth and then eventually it just comes undone. Uh, I'm just showing here the leaflets. You can see they're all very thin. They're all very pliable. Um, it looks very much like a normal aortic valve that has three leaflets. But you can also appreciate that there's no fibrous annulus to the uh, pulmonary root. Um, so you have to trim that muscle down. I'm just filling the pulmonary root just to show you what the leaflets look like. They definitely look like a normal aortic valve. Um, this is the trimming portion and slight scalloping under the commissures. So we really want to minimize all of that muscle because this is all dead tissue from now on. Um, some may ask, well, what about the cusp? How come they don't die? Because um, aortic uh, and pulmonary valve cusps are not vascularized. They uh, stay alive by diffusion of oxygen from the blood. And that's what keeps them alive. So once we've done that, we then implant it on the um, aortic side. Uh, but before we do so, I just give a bit of plegia uh, through the coronaries to make sure that our uh, resection plane here has no bleeders that we should fix right away. Um, here it's orientation. We keep the thicker part anterior and the thinner part posterior. I use interrupted uh, single 4-0 proline sutures. And the main principle is to exclude this um, muscle under, under the insertion of the pulmonary cusps and to really try to sit the valve in an infraannular position, the suture come out rather deep in the LVOT. And you see here, they come in right at the hinge point. These are all interrupted sutures and you can see they follow a plane all the way around. You make sure that you don't 
grasp the leaflets or and you can see from the LVOT what they look like and their position. Um, and you just go circumferentially that way. You work, you stay a little bit higher up where the right non commissure is to avoid the conduction tissue. And again, we're really excluding all that muscle around there. It looks, it looks quite daunting when you see all these sutures on the video like this, but it's actually very, um, it's a very, you know, suture management is obviously part of the operation, but it's actually quite uh, uh, simple to, to do once you have a, a system. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this operation already. Um, and then once that is done, you parachute the valve, you tie all these sutures. Then we put three retraction sutures about two millimeters above the commissures of the autograph. All the PA tissue above that will be resected. Um, but for now, we'll use these sutures to put some tension on the um, autograft to be to facilitate uh, reimplanting the coronary arteries, and the coronary arteries always want to sit in the body of the sinus. It's actually a very um, mindless exercise where you don't even have to think where the coronaries go. I spend a lot more time uh, assessing where they want to sit if I'm doing a benthol or a valve sparing, because it's you know the dacron is rigid, but in this case. Uh, you just sit it in the body of the sinus and it always adapts uh, very nicely. This is a 6-0 proline suture and uh, you just reimplant the left. There's not much uh, to say or, you know, many sort of uh, uh, interesting points to bring about here. And then we'll do the same thing for the right coronary artery. And interestingly, the right always feels like it wants to sit higher than its actual um, level. But again, just trust the, the system, quote unquote, and put the right in the body of the sinus of Valsalva. Not only will this avoid any coronary um, issues, but importantly, it will also allow you to resect all supracommissural PA tissue, which um, will further stabilize the pulmonary autograft in the long term. <clears throat> so we tie this um, right button and then we look inside to make sure that it looks fine. You see here, this is the resecting all that um, supracommissural PA tissue. Uh, these are 90 degree scissors, which are very helpful to do that. And you just follow uh, and you stay right above these traction sutures. And by doing so, you're left with very little, um, with very little PA uh, above the commissures. And those two millimeters of PA will be included in your distal suture line. You see, all you have really is just sinus wall and that is about it. And then before you close the left side, then you shift your attention to the right side again. This is a decellularized pulmonary homograft. Uh, so you transect it distally just proximal to the bifurcation. And we trim the muscle proximally, the infundibular muscle. We, I like to trim it to uh, leave as little as needed of it to just suture it in position. These are cryopreserved homographs, so we always have them in the freezer. They're readily available. And then we start with the distal suture line, followed by the proximal suture line, which I think is an easier sequence than the other way around. Um, this is a suture that you place medially towards on the surgeon side. And then I place a suture on the anterior lip, which will serve as a retraction suture. And then this one here, which will tie down and then will run both the posterior wall followed by the anterior wall. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but the I always cannulate in the aortic arch when doing, well, basically when doing any heart surgery, but more importantly, when doing a ROS. And that allows to keep the cross clamp as high up as possible, just proximal to the nominate artery. And what that means is that that distal anastomosis for the PA is actually made a lot easier as opposed to if you cannulate the distal ascending aorta, your clamp is then, you know, uh, even more proximal to that. And that makes this anastomosis um, a little bit more challenging. Uh, there's not much about this distal anastomosis here. I'll just skip through the video a little bit to take you to the proximal anastomosis here. This is proximal anastomosis. And the only thing you have to bear in mind is the first few sutures this is the area where the first septal may be. So these sutures here have to be very thin. They're almost partial thickness. And as you progress along the interventricular septum, the sutures can be thicker because there's really nothing to um, injure there. And then the, the anterior wall is uh, 
is really just um, it's a very you know very direct just suture. There's there are no structures uh, that can be injured when doing so. It's important to de-air the right ventricle before closing this. And the last step here, this patient had a 4.2 ascending aorta. So instead of replacing the whole thing, I simply interpose a short Dacron tube. This is a 28 millimeter tube um, to separate the uh, STJ of the autograft from the ascending aorta. Otherwise, a 4.2 centimeter aorta would stretch that STJ and perhaps uh, predispose it to um, leaking in the long term. So this is the anastomosis with the autograft and then the anastomosis with the ascending, uh, the distal portion, a more distal portion of the ascending aorta. And, uh, and uh, this way it really stabilizes the sinotubular junction. And the last element will be to stabilize the uh, sinus of Ansalva. And for that, I use the remnant non-coronary sinus swell, which I always leave intact. And after we're off bypass and protamine is given, we just tack it along that Dacron graft and using it as what I call a loose uh, jacket. And that will just support the uh, non-coronary sinus wall uh, uh, at that level. And I'll do the same thing with the left-right coronary um, commissural tongue, which will also provide some external support to the uh, autograft route. So you see here the final look, and this is what it looks like uh, when doing this. This is from a, an upcoming operative techniques a paper that um, will be coming up. And then this is the final result. And this is what the echo looks like. You see good um, valve opening, good valve function, no AI, and importantly, a mean gradient that was in the single digits. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, Abby, I hope uh, I didn't overstay my welcome. Um, but uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, to questions and discussion. And uh, yeah, thanks again for having me here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was an awesome talk. We definitely have time for questions. The session's always booked for two hours just because most people do go over time of it, uh, which is totally fine. Um, but yeah, everyone feel free. I have a couple, but if someone else wants to jump in and ask a question, go for it. You can either put it in the chat box if you don't want to un unmute yourself or just go ahead and unmute yourself. So a quick question. Why don't you use a continuous suture line for your, uh, on the aortic side? So you use continuous suture line on the pulmonary side. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for that. The, the, the main reason I do so is, again, the, you know, the main principle of that proximal suture line is to make sure that that infundibular muscle below the uh, pulmonary cusps is completely excluded from the, when doing the anastomosis. And then the valve really sits in an infraannular position. If you run it, it's a little bit trickier to take deep bites in the LVOT on the one hand. And secondly, it's even more challenging to take bites that exclude that muscle and really are placed all of them right at the hinge points of the cusp insertion line. And so when you do interrupted sutures, you know, every suture is very, very precise and it guarantees that that muscle is completely excluded and that you can really dunk that uh, autograft within the LVOT. And the other thing is in terms of, you know, systolic expansion, it's much more, um, uh, it's much more symmetrical, let's say from a circular standpoint, when you have these interrupted sutures, as opposed to when you have a running suture line. And the last point is from a hemostatic standpoint, in all the cases I've done, I've never had to add a single suture to that proximal suture line the way we do it. Whereas when you run a suture line, as you know, if you go, if you have a bit of a gap or a dog ear, you can have a bit of bleeding and that can be rather challenging, especially if it's poorly located below coronary. So reason number one is really the most important one. The others are more secondary, but, but uh, it's, it has to do with the principles of autograft implantation. So how many sutures do you typically use in one, in one case? Um, usually it ranges from 12 to 15 sutures per sinus. So ultimately you're left with about anywhere between 35 to 45 sutures. Again, it's, it's, it's all a matter of, of having a systematic setup. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there may be surgeons on this um, 
a discussion that that are that you know that are doing Ross. I don't know if Mike True or others are on here, but you know once you get a system going, it really actually becomes a pretty. Um, it's a it's a part of the operation where you can almost tune off a little bit, and when you're tying it, it allows you to re you know reassess and sort of it's 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 not as as bad as it looks on a video. <laughs> Ismail, this is Jessica. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for your excellent presentation and thanks for all your support uh, to your Canadian friends uh, to help us start our program. Uh, we were very lucky to have you. Um, I just want to know, because I have some difficulty uh, still with uh, aortic insufficiency, and sometimes I reduce the analysis of the aortic analyst, but I still have the, because, because you told us to reduce it at about like 25 or something like that. But still, sometimes I still have a discrepancy with the uh, pulmonary analyst, and I feel that I reduce it a little. I'm too aggressive at reducing it, and the pulmonary valve is not that small. So, can you comment on that, please? Yeah, thanks, Jess, and good to good to see you here, and look forward to seeing you again soon. And glad to know that you're continuing the Rosses at the, the Shum. The the um, so the question you pose is really for the Ross in the setting of AI, and just to you know um, uh, go back just you know one step. The reason why Jess is asking the question is because patients with AI and a dilated aortic annulus have two issues. One is there's often a mismatch between the aortic and the pulmonary annulus, where the aortic annulus is usually larger than the pulmonary, with you know larger by more than one to two millimeters, which is an acceptable range. And secondly, because when you we look at long-term studies in terms of durability, the biggest predictors of reoperation are the presence of AI in the dilated aortic annulus at the time of the ROS as an indication for surgery. And so one of the ways that we try to mitigate that risk of reoperation is by doing two things. One is reducing the size of the aortic annulus so that it matches that of the pulmonary. And we do that by using an extra aortic annuloplasty. Um, and um, and the, the way I, we do that, and going back to your point, Jess, is that I place the annuloplasty sutures after I've mobilized the aortic root before I've even um, uh, harvested the autograft. And then the size of the ring really depends on the size of the pulmonary annulus. So let's suppose the pulmonary annulus is 26 millimeters. I'll choose a ring size that is 26 plus about five or six millimeters so that all you're doing is not trying to reduce the aortic annulus infinitely or to a normal aortic, diam aortic annular diameter, but rather so that it matches the pulmonary annulus diameter. And so you only choose the size of the ring once you've harvested the autograft and you've measured the pulmonary annulus diameter. And you certainly don't want to do exactly like you're mentioning. You don't want to make the aortic annulus too small because then everything will be bunched up in there. And that's where you can cause a bit of distortion or prolapse or end up with some degree of AI or some flapping of the leaflets all things that you don't really want to see because they may have an impact on, on the durability of the operation. So, so it's important to base the size of the ring on the size of the uh, pulmonary annular diameter. So it's a little bit of a different thought process than you would do if you're doing aortic valve repair, where you know your main goal is to really reduce the annulus so that it matches that of a normal annular diameter and that it's proportional to the patient's body surface area. In this case, all you're trying to do because you have a pulmonary valve that works in its native position, you're just trying to recreate an anatomy that suits that pulmonary valve so that it feels right at home, quote unquote, when it's, when it's transferred to the aortic position. I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. And then we have a question from Mohammed and another one from Charles. Mohammed, you can go first because you were first to read. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, excellent talk, Dr. Ismail. This is Mohammed from uh, Toronto General Hospital, a fellow. So my question is regarding the orientation of the uh, uh, pulmonary valve. When you, I mean, the pulmonary autograft, when you take it to the aortic position, I just saw in the video, there was no certain position. I mean, I know you said the uh, thicker part should be anterior and the thinner part should be posterior, but I couldn't understand this point. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So no, the other, yeah. The other question, uh, what would be your advice for 
young surgeons who would like to start uh, doing these surgeries where they know expertise in their centers. It is different here in Canada and the US. If you start, you have uh, mentors there. They can be always as a backup or, yeah. But if I want to start it as a new, what would be your advice, please? So, um, yeah, these are good questions, especially the second one. I mean, the first one too, but the second one is a very challenging one. The the first one, just in terms of orientation, the basically the, the autograft when you harvest it is not all... Um, um, is, is not all similar thickness everywhere. The posterior part of the autograft or the PA in its native position, what we call the left facing sinus is usually the thinner of the three sinuses. And the way we propose to implant it is to put that thinner sinus in the left uh, coronary sinus position so that it's supported by posterior mediastinal structures rather than putting it in the anteriorly in the right coronary sinus position where it is then unopposed and it may dilate once under systemic pressures. The reality is that I think this is more of a theoretical consideration than an actual, um, than an actual, you know, fact. But you know, that's just uh, uh, the the proposed sort of uh, orientation. To answer your second question, I think I think there are many elements that come into play um, to for if someone wants to start a program that is not just ROS, but really an aortic reconstructive program that includes valve repair and valve pairing operations in ROS. So basically the whole gamut of, of options for you know, young adults, which if you ask me, I think from an open aortic valves or aortic surgical perspective is really where you as young you know, residents and surgeons in training, for those of you who have an interest in, in aortic pathologies, I think that's really where the future of aortic surgery lies because um, you know the transcatheter techniques are great and they're here to stay uh, to treat the older patients. But again, just like we have limitations with prosthetic AVR, the same issues will be apparent with um, uh, transcatheter valves, if not even more so um, in younger patients. So reconstructive surgery that is based on trying to keep living and biological structures in that aortic position are really important. I think it's important to train you know, if your training program doesn't have um, enough volume to then dedicate an extra year or two with in a center with a mentor who can really, who can really um, teach you all these things and walk you through these uh, different principles of anatomy, of physiology, of surgery, of management of these patients, um, it is important to build a team around you. So not just be a lone ranger uh, where you go having a, a colleague, having buy-in from anesthesia, from cardiology, because you will have complications. Um, it is just part of the deal. I don't think that complications mean you that patients will be dying because as you saw, you can do this quite safely from a mortality standpoint, but you will have some morbidities at the beginning. And unless you have buy-in from everyone around you, that can have a very negative impact on the program as a whole. So I think you have to build, you know, you have to build that team through all the evidence that is out there and through showing a commitment to, you know, to dedicating a large part of your practice to aortic root reconstructive surgery. Um, I mean, the, in brief, this is what I would suggest, but certainly nothing, there's no substitute for the time committed to really learning these operations. It's not something you will learn in two days or by watching a couple of videos or going to a quick course. I think these are, if, if one is serious about them, it is really important to take the time to and invest the time to really learn them. And the one thing I will say is to really audit one's own, and that applies to anything, but really follow and audit your own results because it's the only way that you will show integrity and honesty in what you do, as well as continue to improve as a surgeon. Because what you do on day one is certainly not the way you do it at year five or going forward. And I've been, I was very lucky in Montreal that I had a, a great team. And to this day, we have 99% completeness of annual clinical and echo follow-up on all our root reconstructive patients. And that has really informed a lot of what we've been doing and how we've modified the, some of the techniques that we do over, over the last decade. Thank you. Okay, then Charles, you can go ahead. Good evening, Dr. Lamamsi. Thank you for your talk and your time. Um, 
In the same um, track as Dr. Forcio asked about aortic regurgitation, um, we do have a very conservative um, indication to bring patient with for rust procedure back home here and um, but what is your take about which patient do you take in with a certain grade of aortic regurgitation over their stenosis and which one do you prefer or you say well this is a bit too much now uh, thank you Sean very good to see you and nice to hear from you the um, yeah that's a very important question what do we do about patients with aortic First of all, aortic regurgitation, aortic repair or valve sparing procedures should always be plan A. Um, but assuming that the valve is not repairable because there's calcium or because um, the, you know, I think the approach of just saying, oh, we're simply not proposing a ROS in these patients may be a little uh, excessive in the sense that if you look at the data in the long term, and I mean, again, I hate to keep repeating his, I mean, I like to keep repeating his name, but I just feel like that's all I'm doing today but he's really contributed so much. He's got two manuscripts coming up very soon on uh, the ROS and aortic regurgitation, which we wrote together. And when you examine the data carefully, and again, you have to be evidence-based. When you examine the data, the survival in the long-term is not impacted by some of that reoperation range. And although the durability may not be equivalent, there are reasons why durability is not equivalent. And Jessica touched on one of these elements, the, you know, the, making the annuli uh, match and doing an angioplasty. We trim the aorta. We, you know, like you saw in the video, we use that jacket, we control the blood pressure. These are all things that were not done before in a lot of these series. So yes, if you look at the data from, the, from surgeries done 20 years ago, that's a lesson learned. I think the way to address it is, is perhaps not to be as, as, as dogmatic or as excessive as saying we're simply not going to do it, at least my approach is to ask how can we improve on that, considering that hemodynamically and survival wise, we're still drawing the same benefits from the operation. So what we're trying to do here is to reduce the risk of reoperation. Um, and I think that there is data and Ismail Bahoud published a paper in the European journal from our cohort, uh, where we compared our AI and AS patients using that tailored approach and showing no difference in annulus, sinus, a degree of AI, uh, uh, incidence of reoperation, at least within the first decade after the ROS procedure, we're continuing to follow these patients, as I mentioned earlier. But I think um, it may be a bit of a uh, of a of a uh, you know I think if one can safely do a ROS procedure, there is definitely an argument for proposing it to patients with non-repairable aortic valves if they have an anticipated life expectancy of 15 years or more, so patients under the age of 60, let's say, um, uh, using some of these sort of adjunct uh, techniques. That, that's really my approach. That being said, you, you know, one is never wrong to be conservative and to try to you know, uh, be super selective in, in doing these operations. But I think once you can do it safely, it may, be, uh, it, it may not be unreasonable to, to extend the uh, indications to these patients too. Thank you. Okay, and then David, you have a question as well? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. al -Mamsi. Very nice uh, lecture as usual. Um, I'm David Jolinski from Northwestern Chicago. I have a question um, regarding how often do you see AI after you um, come off pump in your patients? And how do you address this when it's present? Thanks, David. And, uh, and congratulations from Northwestern to Western. I'm really ha I heard the news uh, from Mike, and I'm really, really excited for you. So uh, well done Thank on you. all you've done. David is an excellent example of someone who's really committed time um, to really you know, um, uh, develop an expertise in uh, both in aortic and heart failure surgery in his time spent in Chicago. The, the question you ask is really important, David, and you will see a fair number of patients where once you take the clamp off, you'll have about trace to mild central AI, and that is completely normal. It's physiological. In fact, um, if you tomorrow morning, if you look at the TE of the next patient you do, regardless of what he's having, just look at the pulmonary valve and you'll always see a little jet of central pulmonary regurgitation. That same jet on the pulmonary side, you will see on the aortic side. And the reason being that there are no nodules of Arontius on a pulmonary valve 
and pulmonary valve cusp. So they don't perfectly close that central hole. That central jet of AI doesn't increase over time. It waxes and wanes from echo to echo. Sometimes they describe it, sometimes they don't. That is something you can completely ignore. If you have an eccentric jet, you have to start scratching your, your head because that means that you may have caused some distortion, prolapse of a leaflet or, or and you know, and that's why symmetry of the angles of the commissures, symmetry of the heights of the commissures when implanting and symmetry at the STJ level is really important because any little distortion, as you saw, it's very floppy that pulmonary autograft can cause um, the, uh, the geometry of the pulmonary root to be distorted and some degree of, 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 uh, of regurgitation. I have had that um, in a handful of cases and in all of them I've reclaimed the aorta, reopened and try to fix that by correcting the prolapse, which you know you can determine which leaflet is prolapsing based on the direction of that eccentric jet. And the last jet that you may see uh, occasionally is a commissural jet of, uh, of AI um, that's usually very minimal at one of the commissures. And that's also something that you can completely disregard. And by the time the patients have, get their pre-discharge echo, it really disappears. And it's really just a matter of the root kind of sitting in position and, and finding its, you know, its final sort of uh, um, um, geometry. So these commissural jets are, are a total non-issue. I used to fuss a lot about them at the beginning. And then I, you know, I, I figured, let me see what happens to them. And they actually all spontaneously disappear. So the only jet that is worrisome is an eccentric jet of AI, which should be addressed uh, right then and there. The leaflets are obviously very thin. So central plication sutures are can be you know can be dangerous because you can tear the leaflet, but you just have to be very gentle in doing it. And in a couple of patients where they, I thought they were really too thin, I just ran a a six so cortex suture back and forth and tied it on the outside, and that really fixed that that mild prolapse that we had that we had induced. Well, thank you for the answer. Uh, Ismail, this is Jessica again. I have another question. Um, the thing is for the selection of patients, so uh, usually even the older patient in the 50s or something, those people are doing like like your picture, Ironman or Marathon or some stuff like that. So my difficulty is telling them to stay a little bit more, uh, not less active, but during that time period. Some of them, uh, we, we try to control their blood pressure and everything. And it's so hard, uh, even if I tell them not to exert or do uh, exercise, not going back to running and stuff like that, they do it. So I don't know how, how you're doing it or what you tell them. Um, you know, I just try to explain it to them as best I can. The, the, uh, the, so what Jessica is referring to, which we didn't really um, discuss very much in the presentation is, the fact that it's it's really critical for the long-term durability of the operation to control blood pressure, not allowing systolic pressures to exceed about 110 or so for the first six months, six to 12 months really after surgery. And the reason being that you want this pulmonary route to adapt to systemic pressures and you don't want the pressures to run up in the 140s and 50s because any early dilatation before adaptation will beget later dilatation. And that's part of the reason why you know, you see in some series high rates of uh, reintervention in the longer term. Um, and so, you know, when they exercise or when they, you know, I always tell them aerobic exercise is not so bad. What I don't want them doing is more like weightlifting and, and uh, push-ups and pull-ups or, or CrossFit or, 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 you know, very heavy intervals or that kind of thing will get your blood pressure uh, quite high. If they want to swim, bike, run, um, you know, at a decent pace where they can still sort of line up a sentence while they're doing so, I think that's reasonable. Um, so, you know, I don't stop them from doing so, but if I see a big bodybuilder walk into the, into my office, you know, I'll tell him that the, the agreement or the commitment I need from him is for him to stop doing that for, you know, a good period of time, which for some of these people means that their quality of life becomes miserable because that's how they define themselves. And that's fine. I think that, you know, you may, want to reconsider then the options. But people who do Ironman and, and aerobic exercise, I'm, I'm fine with them sort of resuming their activities provided their baseline blood pressure is well controlled. And you know while they do their exercise, it may go up a little bit, but it's not gonna go up tremendously if, if, they're, if they're reasonable with their exercise. 
but I have had patients run a marathon, you know, three months after the ROS. You know, it's you can't control what patients do, mm -hmm. but uh, but you can only try to explain as best you can. Okay. Dr. Moss, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Abigail. Hey, Ismail, nice to see you. Hey, man. Um, <laughs> uh, even if only virtually, but, uh, and also David, uh, you could have given a shout out to McGill there also. You're not just from Northwestern, <laughs> but- uh, That's, what um, no, it's, That's what happens. That's what happens. No, uh, you're right. A quick question. Sorry. Uh, you probably covered this, but I came out a bit late, but because, uh, you know, I, I don't do ROS procedures myself, but I've sent some patients to you. I also set, still send patients over to Philip the Mouse at the Institute. Um, and so what I struggle with sometimes is how to discuss the autograph, the homograph with them, because the autograph, I mean, I know we'll have good results long term. And uh, but the autograph, even just following, you know, quoting studies is kind of hard. But what do you actually tell people in your clinic as far as what they need to know about it, risk of needing reintervention or how it might affect them down the line? Yeah, that's a really good point, which the which 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 has to be discussed, obviously, because, you know, again, one of the things you'll hear often is, oh, you're replacing a single valve disease by a double valve disease. And what I always tell them is we're not really replacing it by double valve disease, it's double valve surveillance. So we need to keep an eye on these two valves, but they're actually working pretty well for the majority of patients, at least for the first two decades. The incident, what I quote them at least is an incidence of, of um, pulmonary homograph dysfunction that requires some form of reintervention, whether transcatheter or open, is about 0.5% patient year. In other words, about 5% at 10 years, and about 10 to 15%, let's say at 20 years to be conservative. If you look at the most recent German Ross uh, registry data uh, that was published last week in JAK, 2,500 patients, the incidence on the right side was 0.62% patient year. Um, and these were using, and, and this was using a combination of non decellularized homographs as well as xenografts, so tissue valves put in on, on the right side. Um, one of the, some of the things that we have done to, that have, I think that will continue to improve these outcomes is A, using decellularized pulmonary homographs, which really reduce the immune and inflammatory reaction in these patients. Secondly, we oversize the homographs. We don't try to true size them. So we use 28, 29, and 30 millimeters, which even if there's a bit of an inflammatory reaction, a bit of constriction, it won't have much of a hemodynamic impact. And thirdly, we give patients anti-inflammatories for the first six months, which is the period of time where that inflammatory reaction may be the most sort of uh, uh, intense. And all of these things are things that have been introduced as based on the data that has come up from, you know, these pioneer uh, series with long-term outcomes. So, you know, in these series, you see about a 0.5 to 1% patient year, depending on what is used. And I think with what we're using today and the way we're using it, we should see an improvement on some of these data. Um, the other thing I'll tell them is for the right side, the, the, in about 50 to 75% of these patients, the approach will be a transcatheter approach as opposed to an open approach if it's isolated pulmonary homograft dysfunction. The only, um, the only patients who would not be a good candidate for it would be patients where when you do the scan, you see the left main behind the pulmonary homograft being too close for comfort and too close for comfort is less than three millimeters of distance because when you deploy that, um, that stent and that sapien valve or that melody valve, um, there's a risk of compressing the left main posteriorly. And so when it's a gray zone, what we do is we ask the interventionalist to go and inflate a, a, a balloon in the, uh, in the pulmonary to see, and then shoot the left main to see whether there's any, um, you know, either constriction or whether there's any, you know, anything that, that we see to it. Um, in which case we just abort that procedure and we do it open. Um, so, you know, all these patients, the majority of these patients that will need a reintervention will be able to be done without an actual open surgery, which is not the case for the left side. The autograph does not calcify and therefore any reintervention should be open. That's also Great. something thanks. patients should know. Great. Thank you. And thanks for doing this. This is a treat you. for everybody. You good too. To see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I. Any other questions, guys? Okay. So 
That was great. Um, great uh, Q&A period for sure. Um, I guess I think we'll 6.20 now, at least, well, Edmonton time. Um, so I think we'll leave it there for now. Um, and again, thank you so much, Dr. al Hamamzi, for taking the time uh, out of your Tuesday night to do this for us. We really appreciate it. Abby, thanks a lot for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. And I, again, I really look, I was sitting in your seat 15 years ago, and I really look forward uh, to, to seeing you guys again in uh, upcoming CCC meetings. And for those of you who are interested in visiting, just uh, just feel free to reach out. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Have a good night. Bye, Manny.